Okay, everybody. Um, so Bob Traub has been a member of Novak, uh, certainly, well, longer than I have. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> we'll not we'll not put we'll not put dates on things but Thanks. um bob uh, uh bob's also a very active member in the uh brian Berger imaging group that we have um the little sub sub group a special interest group of the club that oops you just photos. and very recently bob put up uh or, well bob did a presentation on um on photographing and processing uh, images on comets. And since, you know, uh, since until earlier in the week, we thought we were gonna have a good one uh, before it broke up. Uh, but now that Swan's on its way up, we've got another possibility coming through. It seemed an absolutely apropos time to have Bob uh, present to the club at large on, uh, on some, of the, uh, some of what he's learned on how to, uh, how to do this. So Bob, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, as Chris says, my name is Bob Traub. I've been a member since 1998, I think, around that time, and uh, learned an awful lot from you guys. It's wonderful being part of the club because we all share what we know, and that's part of what I'm trying to do here. Um, the comets that are up, there's there's been a couple of them recently. SWAN is certainly one of them, Comet. Um, the name escaped me, the one that's breaking up. I'll talk about it in a second is there. But there are some others that are going to be in the sky shortly and or are in the sky now, and, and they may be of interest to you. So there's some interest in getting that, getting the ability to capture that um, and then present that well. What I want to try and show you, let me go back here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about capturing comets. What, what do you have to do to take the pictures of the comets? Now the comet's moving against the background sky, against the background of the stars, and so that represents some processing problems. We'll talk about how to handle that when we use the PixInsights um, uh, process called comet alignment. Now most of the information that I've got comes from Warren Keller's book, PixInsight, I'm sorry, Inside PixInsight, and this is a second edition. Um, there's some good information on it, um on page i think it's 213 3, 312 something like that it's it's um in the index but it's 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 a specific process that he that he's not he that picks insight uses to to pick to capture a comet and have it against a fixed background of stars um comet atlas was a pretty good look like it was going to be pretty promising back in march uh, terry lovejoy took this picture of it and over the for the next two weeks, it started getting brighter and brighter and, and actually started forming a tail. But as we know, as you have you probably heard, around that time, Comet Atlas broke up. This is a picture by Massey and Haig um, that actually was able to capture the, the, the nucleus of the comet breaking up. Um, once that started to happen, we got some good pictures from Hubble of the comet breaking up and that's really wonderful because now we get to see four comets if you have to if you happen to have a hubble um but unfortunately because of it's because of the way that happens the brightness of the comet starts to fade it begins to become more distributed and you don't see the tight nucleus with a tail and so it becomes less and less um attractive as a as a visual target and also as a photographic target the good news is if you go to comet watch Dot, dot, co, dot co uk current observable comets there's a bunch of them that are that are beginning to show promise chris mentioned comet swan um, and that's currently magnitude eight but it's brightening comet swan um, appears early in the morning right now and i think it will will be early an early morning comet for by early morning i mean before before dawn uh, for the next several weeks or maybe months i'm not sure exactly how long it'll be this is a picture that uh, Rolando Lagustri, yeah, sorry, Rolando. This is a picture that Rolando took um, back on the 13th of April. So it's developing a nice, a nice nucleus, a nice coma, and it's got a pretty decent tail. It's going to be hard to capture because it, it's cap you, you got to see it early in the morning, and you got to start taking pictures. Um, 
as you're starting to take the pictures, the, the comet's going to be rising and the sun's going to be coming up. So you won't have a whole long time to capture the comet before the sky starts getting bright. But it certainly is a possible target. The other one that's interesting and holds some potential is the 2017 PanStars T2. It's currently a magnitude 9, which is not very bright. And it's fairly steady, but it's going to be up all night long, somewhere between, uh, for latitude, somewhere between 5 degrees and 70 degrees. So it's going to be around for a while. This is a picture that Pete Lawrence took. Again, a wide, wide field image of the comet. And this is this is the um, this the sky safari image of where it is tonight, a little about an hour ago, yeah, about almost an hour ago. Uh, this is the meridian. We are looking north because there's Cassiopeia, and so it's fairly high up. I don't remember how high it up is, but it's fairly high up. It's above the North Celestial Pole, and it will start to go down. It's it doesn't set, so it'll start going around as the as the night progresses. It'll start going down and around. The North Celestial Pole, so it should be available uh, for taking pictures for most of the evening, for the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, it's fairly, as I say, fairly steady and 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 at magnitude nine, but um, it makes for an interesting target. So, what do you have to do to take a picture of a comet? I mean, we we've, we've seen these things in the in the uh, in the on the internet about the wonderful pictures and how big they are. But how do you and I do it? How do we how do we venture out to try and take a picture? I got some suggestions. That's basically all I can I can tell you, give you right now. Um, depending on what kind of equipment you have, what kind of time you have, what kind of mount you have, that kind of thing. First of all, if you can figure it out based on um, um, either trial and error, or if you can find a, a, a picture of it and measure the tail, try and frame it with the tail if possible if it has a tail. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You'll see a couple of mine later on, the comet doesn't have a tail. It's just the way it works. Um, but if you can frame it with a tail, it looks more interesting. And if the tail has any detail in it because of the solar wind influences or things like that, it also becomes uh, a much better shot. My personal opinion, because this is what I'm used to using, is I like using a one-shot color DSLR. Now you don't have to have a DSLR, any mono camera, CCD or CMOS will also take pictures of it very nicely. But with a single color, whether that's mono or a DSLR, a single one shot color, it simplifies the processing. We'll see that a little bit later on. If you have a, a filter wheel and you tr and you shoot in RGB or LRGB, the three, the, the colors, um, you have to process each color separately because the comet is moving if you try and process them as a batch, they have a tendency to get um, uh, blurred. The colors blur, uh, and so you'll get some sort of a chromatic aberration in that sense. So my suggestion is to use a DSLR if you have it. Okay. The, capturing a comet, taking a picture comet, is very similar to uh, taking any other deep sky photo, it's photos of a deep sky image. Um, if you have a camera lens, you mount it on a tripod, and when I say wide field, that's a relative, relative term as opposed to, I'm talking about using a camera lens as opposed to using a telescope. Um, and you can take pretty significant pictures. If you have 100, just remember there's this thing called the 500, um, uh, the 500, the rule of 500s. If you take your focal length and divide it by 500, that roughly gives you the number of seconds, maybe I have that backwards, upside down, gives you roughly the number of seconds that you can uh, take your exposure. Yeah, I actually have that upside down. So it's 500 divided by the focal length. I'll fix that later. So if I have a 100 millimeter lens, I divide that into 500, and that gives me the number of seconds that I can shoot without the stars trailing significantly. So if I take a large number of five second pictures, and I can stack those and come up with a, a picture that's not too bad. Of course, uh, as an astrophotographer, I've, I use, and a lot of people use an equatorial mount that's properly polar aligned, and we, we set up an auto guider somehow so that it, it's tracking the stars so that we have a fixed background of stars and, that, and, the, and the comet, you see the comet moving across that fixed background of stars as you take each picture. As with any uh, deep sky photo, we got to take our calibration 
uh, images, flats, bias, darks. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Those are things that you'll you'll learn about later on as you get into astrophotography. But for right now, any of those uh, uh, means are, are adequate for taking a picture. You saw the wide field image we saw, uh, Comet Pan, the Comet Panstar's Comet a little while ago. You can do that with a, a, a DSLR and a, a telephoto lens or a medium medium distance lens. Now the hard part, well, not the hard part, one of the hard parts is how to determine your exposure. And by exposure, I mean the duration of the picture. Of course, here we have a five second duration that's limited by st trailing stars. But if I've got a guided mount, I can take longer durations. What you have to be careful of is the comet nucleus is very bright. And so if you take a picture, a long photograph of the comet nucleus, it's, it's going to oversaturate and you're not going to be able to get any detail, much like the the, the, tr the, um, the trapezium in Orion. It's hard to get a picture of because it's so bright. And so the 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 um, the, uh, the, new, the the nebula around it fades away. So you, you have to play around a little bit with the exposure. And as I say, it's it's sort of whoops, it's sort of like um, <laughs> you have to depend on luck a little bit. But my suggestion is take a few pictures, look at the subs, and see if you're getting uh, some detail in the nucleus as well as some detail in the tail because the tail is much fainter. So it's a little a little bit of a of a, a balancing act you have to do. Personally, I think that more exposures are better. The more subs you can take, the more individual images, whether they're five second images or anything else, the more subs you can take, the, the more depth you'll get in the picture. You'll be able to pull out the, the fainter details with processing easier if you have more exposures. Uh, of course, based on where the comet is, you may not be able to get a lot of exposures. So I was uh, taking a picture of a pan stars comet several years ago, and it was it was only about 15 or 20 degrees above the horizon. So I was only able to get a, a low, a small number of subs before it sat, sank into the muck. The other recommendation I have is, and I'll, you'll see why this becomes an important later. If you have enough time, pause, put a, put a, put a pause between each of your subs, between each of your sub exposures. And the reason you do this is you wanna allow the comet to move to a different location than it was when you last took the last picture. This leaves space between the stars so that the stars themselves, when you align it on the head of the comet, the stars become individual stars and it makes it easier to reject them later. We'll talk more about that when we get into processing. But if you can, if you have that luxury, put, some, put a pause between. Well, our recommendation is 30 seconds, a minute, but that will all depend on how fast the comet is moving. If the comet is really far away from the Earth and it's moving slowly, a minute won't get you much motion. Point is, take the picture anyway. You can process it, it'll come out okay, but it'll, it'll work better if you can have a, a space between the stars. Um, you can find out what the real motion is, the, the actual motion online or through Sky Safari, but the slower the comet is moving, the longer the pause is needed if you're gonna leave space between the stars. I'll show you a couple of pictures of what I mean here. Uh, well, I'll show it to you now. Uh, this is Comet Atlas. This is the one that broke up, but back on March 29th, Chris Schur took this picture of uh, Comet Atlas. And it says down here in the caption that this was a 45 minute exposure. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, accuse Chris Schur of lying, but that's not a 45 minute exposure. That is nine separate four or five minute exposures. So if I zoom in on this, you can see that all of those exposures are centered on the head of the comet. And because the comet is moving, the stars trail it, 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 as, as each shot is taken. And if you look closely, you can see the stars that have moved into a different position every time a photograph was taken. Now this one will process out, will process out well because you've got some definition between each of the stars. So that's what I mean by pausing between each each picture and get some getting some definition. That will allow the software to filter out the comet to to, uh, to not the comet to filter out the stars and make it um, um, easier to 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 reject them. All right. So what are we going to talk about? Um, if you guys have any questions on taking pictures of comets, uh, submit them. Chris Kagi is going to. Pot, compile them and, and stop me if necessary, or at the end, he's gonna read them off to me so I'll answer, be able to answer some questions. I hope that was clear to you. 
So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about comet processing next for the rest of the rest of this uh, presentation. The the thing I'm not going to talk about very very much is taking the frames which we just talked about and then calibrating the sub sub, sub frames. By that I mean taking flats and darks and biases and then running those through PixInsight or running those through Photoshop or some other tool to calibrate the flame, fl frames to get better pictures. The other thing I'm not going to talk about, although I'll do it once, is, is after you've calibrated all those frames, you want to register all those subframes. You want to align them so that all the stars are in the same place. When you do that, the comet's going to smear. The comet's going to be moving from frame to frame. That's where PixInsight's comet alignment process comes in handy. I'm going to talk about this process three different times. Each time I do it, I'm going to step down into a lower, lower, lower and lower level of detail. So I'm trying to give you a picture for, in general, what is it that the common alignment process does, and then we'll talk about how to do it, and then I'll demonstrate it. So the first thing you're going to do after you've got the stars registered on, after you get all the subs registered on the stars, you want to stack all those pictures so that the comet is in the same place. That's gonna cause the stars to move like we saw in the earlier image. Once you've got that, you wanna integrate all of those. You wanna stack all those up and make one picture. And when you do that, you're going to, to, to uh, scrub out the, the individual stars because they're not in every frame in the same place. And that Once that happens, you've taken a picture of, you've stacked up all the pictures, You've taken away all the stars, and now you have a picture of just the comet. Kind of interesting the way that works. Once you have a picture of just the comet, you subtract that from all the individual frames. The software basically says, I'm going to reduce all of those pixels by the amount of data contained in that comet master. So you've removed it, you remove the comet. Then when you stack and integrate those that only have stars, you get a star field. That, is, that just has the stars and no comet, and you wanna save that as a star master. Finally, using pixel math, another tool that's in the PixInsight family, you wanna add the comet master to the star master, and lo and behold, you have a picture of, a, of the stars with a comet, and the stars aren't moving, and the comet's not moving, you just have a, a pretty picture of the comet. Once you've got that, then you apply all the other techniques that you've learned in deep sky imaging and elsewhere to make this thing pretty. You want to you want to stretch it. You want to denoise it. You want to do all these other things. I'm not going to talk about that. I I I am not a PixInsight expert. I've been struggling with PixInsight for a couple of years now. A couple of things I've learned how to do, but that's not not I don't learn I didn't haven't learned how to do these last steps well. So that's what we're going to do. Let's talk about it. Now here's a single frame, schematic of a single frame. It's got stars, it's got a comet, and over the over a period of some time, 40 minutes, an hour, don't know, I'm gonna take several pictures of the comet and the stars. Now if I line the stars all together from each picture, it looks like that, the stars are in one place, but the comet has moved from one place to another. If I stack it on the comet, then the stars have moved from one place to another. We saw that in the picture of Comet Atlas that we saw, a uh, Comet, uh, yeah, Atlas that we saw a little while ago. This is where PixInsight Comet Alignment Process comes in. It aligns the comets, it aligns all the subs on the comet, and then we reject the stars and we save that as a, this is a picture of the process itself. We save that as the Comet Master. The next thing we do is the, we use this section, the subtract, we put the Comet Master image in the subtract button, and it basically subtracts the comet from each one. Remember I told you I was gonna repeat this over and over to kind of give you an idea of how that works. Let's look at it in, in a real shot. This is a picture I took of Comet Wortman 46P. And here we are, the pictures are aligned on the comet, and you'll see the stars are trailing. Here they're aligned on the stars, and you see the comet's trailing. If I were to take a closer look at those stars, you'll see there are individual pictures that are individual images of the stars that are cause, make that trail. If I can get rid of those stars and create a comet only image, and I can get rid of the comet and create a star only image, 
then when I when I paste them together and I add them together, I get a picture of Comet Wirtman, 46P Wirtman, in a star field. And this particular comet had no significant tail. I can see a very faint thing here, but that's not significant. I mean, it's not noticeable. But when I add them together, I get a picture of the comet in the star field. So um, let's gonna, again dive down one level deeper. So using the comet alignment process, I'm going to have all those all those pictures so that the stars are all aligned, but the comet's moving. The comet alignment process will ask me to highlight the first the first image of the comet. When it does that, it notices where it is on the on the image. It gets the coordinates of that picture on the image. Then it asks me to highlight the last image, last comet in the image. So it now knows where the first one is. It knows the last one is from where the last one is from each picture. It knows the time from the data inside the picture. It knows the time that that picture was taken. So it now knows where every comet is on every, where the comet is on every single picture. It calculates the picture. When it does that, it then aligns all the subframes. It moves all the subframes so that the, uh, the comet nucleus is in the same place. And then we can save that as uh, uh, we, we save that in a, in a file, a folder rather called Comet Align. That's what I do. You name it, whatever you want. So now that I've got all the all the comets stacked on top, the, the stars blur. We've seen that a couple of times now. And all I got to do is say, hey, if if this pixel doesn't contain light in every frame, then delete it. So. When it immigrates, it aligns the subframes and it clips to reject the stars as outliers because it's not in it because the star is not in every frame. It basically gets rid of it. Okay, what happens is the stars disappear and you get a comet-only image. The neat part about this is that the com the the uh, align the comet align process does this automatically uh, just once once it has the beginning and the ending position of the comet. So I now I've got a comet master. Then I go back and I do it again. Only this time I tell it, I tell it to subtract the comet master. Remember, we we save that as a comet master. Now I'm telling it to subtract that. And it you identify the first one, identify the last one, and it automatically erases that comet from every single one of the subframes until I am left with a field of stars and no comet. Of course, we then save that as the star master. Okay. When I add those together, the star master and the comet master, I add those together, I now have the picture that I've been trying to trying to achieve. I have a picture of the comet with a, on, a, on, a, on a precise and a very accurate star field. And you're done. Um, I'm going to step through this really quickly because it's just a summary of what I just told you again. You identify the position of the comet on each subframe. You put a little green circle over the comet. You align and save those. And you integrate that, rejecting the stars, and it creates a comet image. Using PI's comet alignment, comet alignment process again, you subtract the comet data from each frame. You align and integrate the cometless images, the images that have no comet in it, to create a star master. Then you use pixel math to create and combine the stars. So here is the, the picture of Comet Wirtman, 46P Wirtman, that we processed, I processed some time ago, where you have a clear star field and you have a comet. Maybe a hint of a tail right there, but that's basically the the goal is to get a comet without a picture, without a without a without either the stars or the comet be blurry. Before I move on and demonstrate this, are there any questions? So, Bob, is this? Um, yeah. So there's a question here. Is does this have to be a a, a very dark sky activity? If you're doing short exposures, you know, you say you were talking about, you know, if you're using a 100 millimeter lens, you're talking about a five second exposure, perhaps, before you get significant star trailing. Um, well, anyway, uh, is it, you know, does it have to be dark sky? Um, you know, it's the old answer, you know, the better, the darker, the better. Uh, you're trying to take pictures, not just of the head of, of the nucleus of the comet, but you're trying to get pictures, if there is one, of the coma around the comet and then the tail the tail can be very faint if the background sky is too bright as it might be when it's when it's when, if it's a if it's a morning or an evening comet these 
the sky might be brightening or darkening depending upon evening or morning um you you know you'll be better off with a darker sky having said that if you have the luxury of taking a lot of images um, there's an ongoing debate among the astrophotography community about whether or not longer images um, or shorter images give you better better processing. There is it better to process 10 long images or a thousand short images? And quite frankly, I think the story is still out on that. So if you have some if you have some brightened sky that's not super dark and you have short images, no, you don't want to you don't want to wipe out the the faintness of the comet with sky glow because you very easily lose that but if you can get a picture that's that's that keeps the sky glow under control um and take shorter images if you stack those up if you're if you have software that will allow you to do that automatically this the um you'll, you should be able to you may be able to get uh, an image of the comet darker is better but shorter images can can help you there okay and then on the flip side of that uh, also then um, is there an exposure? Well, what what is the upper limit for exposures? Where you then you start to you know maybe if if you you dropped out, how long do you go until you get the comet uh, start the comet itself starting to smear? Let's um, set the set the the ground rules the basics if you are taking a fixed on a fixed on a if you're taking the picture on a fixed tripod then you have to follow the rule of 500s which says you divide your focal length into 500 and that mm -hmm. tells you about how long you can take the picture before the stars and the comet trail okay. if you have a really long focal length thousand millimeter you can take about a half a second uh, before the before the uh, the stars and the comets start to trail, if however you have an equatorial mount that is tracking the sky either accurately or or I mean you know either closed loop with a with guiding or without, um, then your exposure can be longer. Um, and the, the question is, I think, how long is your exposure? The question is, I think, how long can the exposure be before you start getting motion of the comet through the exposure? And the answer is it depends on how fast the comet's moving. Okay, uh, if this comet is relatively close to the Earth, um, you know, less than a, a half an AU, that's considered pretty close. Then the comet's going to be moving fairly fast across the sky, and you'll be limited on how long you can take. I think this is opinion. I haven't tried any of this, but I think you're going to be more um, constrained by um the, the the length of your ability your, your your camera and your mount's ability to track the sky um then the comet moving okay that's just a personal opinion i'm not sure of that but it's going to be based on one of those two scenarios sounds good thanks sir okay any other questions for now okay what i'm going to do now assuming the technology lets me so i'm going to go into pix insight um, when I took this image originally, this is the final image. Can you guys see this okay? I don't know. Can you guys see this okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, this is the final image of what I'm trying to get at, almost what I'm trying to get at. It's a picture of Comet Lovejoy. Now, Lovejoy was back in 2015. It has a lovely tail. You can't see it here because it's not finished processing, but uh, has a lovely tail and had some detail in it, which we'll try and pull out. But this is the this is 28. This is picture taken with 28 images, 28 DSLR images. You can see the stars are all well aligned, but you can see the comet, the head of the comet, is smeared. The comet has moved during the time it took those 28 images. Took to take those 28 images. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, I have a dust donut here, which I haven't gotten rid of, but we won't worry about that right now. So this is 28 images stacked on the star. Um, this is the same, tw this is six images. And the reason I, I'm, uh, the reason I show you this, because I want it, to, it takes a long time to process 28 images. And I'm going to try and give a demonstration. So I took six of those images. Some of the images were at the start of the run. Some of the images were at the start of the run. Some of the images were at the end of the run. And you notice that the distance between the images is not the same. So I, I took 
um, didn't they, they don't have to be equal intervals of the stars. The the PixInsight's smart enough to know where the star was when the image was taken. So I this is what happens when you um, I used only six images to to take that to take that image because of because of the amount of time it takes. I'm going to do this demonstration with only six images. It takes about 45 seconds to process at each step, so it shouldn't be too bad. Let me get rid of these for now. All right. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to blink. Blink is a wonderful way to see what the images are that you are trying to figure out, trying to do something with. So I'm going to take the six images that I chose, open it up. It's going to load up. Doesn't take very long for six. And Fix Insight automatically adjusts the exposure so that it's able to be seen. Now, to make this more visible, I'm going to zoom in and zoom in. And now I'm going to do about a third of a second. I'm going to have it step through. So you can see two things are happening. Number one, the stars are moving. And number two, the comet's moving. Well, that's really hard to do something with because I can't tell where anything is because there's nothing to go as, a, as far as a reference. If I stop that and get rid of that, what I'm going to then do is go to star alignment. This allows me to add all those files we just opened up. I'm going to add all those files. I'm going to pick one. I'm going to pick one. Nope, not. View uh, files. There we go. I'm going to pick one as the reference, and it will move all the other images so that they cover over that one that one format. Now I want to take and put those somewhere, and where I'm going to put them is these are going to be registered. They're not aligned on anything other than being registered. So I'm going to select that as the folder, meaning registered, meaning all aligned on one another, and then make that go. Okay. So as I say, it takes about 45 seconds to do the six images. Um, I've got this all running over off my SSD, my, my solid state hard drive. So it should take less than other ways. Um, you can imagine how long this takes with 28 or 100 images. Almost done. OK, so it's still running. Fix Insight will tell me when it stops. Now saving the output files. And it's done. Now just to see what I've done, I'm going to go to the registered folder and open those six files that are registered now. And I'm going to run through that. You can see now that the stars are all in the same place, but now the comet is moving. So this is the this is the, the material I have to work with. You can see there were some clouds coming in as these things were being taken because the sky started getting brighter. But that we won't worry about that. That'll all work itself out. So we've got stars registered and the comets moving. So I'm going to get rid of that. Next thing I want to do is open up the comet alignment process. I want to add the files I just registered. Um, these are the registered files. Open them up. I want to output it because what I'm what I'm outputting is I'm outputting the stars that the 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 images that are aligned on the comet. So what I want to do, and let me move this over here so we can see it. I open the first one. Now it doesn't automatically do this, so I have to increase the brightness of it. And I also want to zoom in a bit. I put my cursor over the head of the nucleus and I click the button. So it takes and puts a circle around the head of the nucleus. I don't know if I can get this or not. 
but there's also, I don't know if you can see it, there's also a small circle that is calculated to be around the brightest point of the nucleus. And even if I were to click it over here, it would still calculate, calculate the brightest point. So it's not sensitive about where you click it. You don't have to be right on. But it calculates the brightest point. You notice down here, we're in the parameters. For the first image, it's showing me the coordinates of those parameters for the first image. Now I'm going to take the last image. I'm going to brighten it. Zoom in a bit. And I'm going to put my cursor over it again. And again, it puts a circle around it, puts a circle over the nucleus. And here I have the coordinates of the second image. Well, it knows when the first image was taken, because that's embedded in the, in the camera, in the picture data. It knows when the second image was taken. And so therefore, it knows the rate of change. And it calculates it right here. It knows the rate of change of the comet as it moves through the sequence of stars. So. Now I've got I've got the the rate I'm gonna I'm not gonna subtract anything so this upper this subtraction image needs to be, be blank so now I'm gonna tell it to align all those images on the head of the comet. You didn't have to do anything special to uh, identify you know the, the outer bound the coma or the presence of a tail it's it, it's able to find all of that just by yep. you're identifying the the head I'll go down here to the you just click somewhere on that close to the center but somewhere on the yep. head of the comet and it creates a little circle where it calculates the brightest portion of that nucleus to be and it uses those coordinates to figure out where the comet is and then how far it's moved from one to the other. Okay. Once I've, got, once I've got that done, I can close these images. I don't need them open anymore. And now let's go back to Blink. We're going to open up the comet aligned images, which we just created. Now we should see. Now we should see that the all these images are aligned on the head of the comet. And lo and behold, the star field moves while the head of the comet remains in the same place. Now, of course, as the star field moves, you pick up some, some areas where there is no signal, there is no picture, but you'll get rid of that later when you crop it out. But now all of these images are centered on the head of the comet. Okay, so let's stop that, we'll get, close that. All right, so the next thing we want to do is take those images that we just created. We want to add them to the image integration. So this is the comet align folder. We want to add the images we just created. And now this is where it gets a little tricky. This is where you have to be judicious and maybe experiment a little bit on some of the settings because what you're trying to do is get rid of the stars that are moving but keep the comet. For Lack of a better reason, I keep it on average. It might work better if I were to choose median, but I haven't tried that. You might try it. Uh, all of these things are, are well documented. When you over when you um, mouse over them, they tell a description of what each of the options are. Um, I found that for the image integration, the default options work pretty well. Um, pixel integration, um, the, the the rejection, pixel rejection rather basically depends on how many images you have. If you have six images or less, you want to choose one. It's called, it's called um, uh, percentile clipping. If you have six Im more than six images, you want to use one of the others. Some of them are really pretty sophisticated, and quite frankly, I don't quite know what they mean. I tried a couple of them earlier while I was, while I was um, getting ready for this. One that seems, even though I have six images, six images is, is um, right at the cusp between being able to use this Windsorized Sigma clipping method, but that seems to work better. Uh, we want to clip the high pixels. These are all default uh, default um, uh, selections. Now I want to lower that. I want to open this up. And this is where you might want to make an adjustment. What we're trying to do is get rid of the stars. We want to clip the high signals. And so bringing that down to about four seems to work well. Experiment with all three of these and see what works best for your particular image. 
but bringing that down to about 4A is recommended in, in, in Keller's book, but it also seems to work well. Uh, the third pixel rejection has to do with gain and readout noise. I don't play with that large scale. That's, that's really not a uh, concern. So I'm going to apply that globally. And what it's going to do is integrate all six of those images into one picture. We hope that it immigrates it so well that we only have a comet that all the stars have been gotten rid of. That almost never happens, and it won't happen here, but that's the goal, to get rid of all of the stars and just have the comet. Move this out of the way a little bit. Again, if you play with those parameters, you can do a better or worse job of getting rid of the stars. If you have distance between the stars, um, then it get rid, gets rid of it in an easier way than if the stars are overlapped because they because the comet hasn't moved very far. Almost done. Large numbers of images is patience. I've heard some of our imagers talk about going upstairs and making scrambled legs and having dinner. That's why it's six. We smashed them all together to create one image. That will show up here in another couple of seconds, I'm hoping. Things are moving, you can see. Okay. Now this actually creates three images. These are the these are the pixels that it rejected as being high. If I had a higher a higher number, I would move that down to 0.4. If I had a higher number, it would this would be darker. But we don't really need that. But it's good to know what's been rejected. This is what re was rejected on the low side. Nothing particularly interesting was rejected on the low side. So here we are with the new image, you can see the head of the comet without even stretching, without even expanding the, the sensitivity of the image. But if I, if I expand it out, you can see I've got the head of the comet. I've got a little bit of tail here, but I've got some stars here and some stars elsewhere. So we've got to try and take care of that because this is what we're going to subtract from the star field. And one of the things that we can use to do that is a process called clone stamp. Now, I got to close this first. A process called clone stamp. Oops, processes, clone stamp. Now, you may think this is cheating because I'm cloning something and not making it real. I like to have a fairly good size radius, a fairly good size image, and I like to have the softness. There's not a hard to find edge to it. And I don't want to have full opacity. I don't want to create, I don't want to create circles on the image. I want to kind of bl blur it so that it's so that it's um, almost no unnoticeable. So I take my control button, click the thing, you'll see there's an X there, and I can come over here and I whoops. I gotta undo that because I went too far. And I can just kind of feather out that group of stars. And I want to come over here on this side. I want to feather out that group of stars. Again, I don't want real hard boundaries. I just want to get rid of the brightness that was caused by those stars not being fully rejected. I think it did a pretty good job of getting rid of the stars, but not perfect. Okay, so I could go on and I could find other places where I'm going to, I would reject. So once I've selected those places that need to be rejected i need to apply that to the image and that changes the image i now have uh, a, a, a comet master so i'm going to save that file save as you can put it anywhere you want oops this pc i'll go back to c demo desired registered comet aligned i i can put it anywhere i want but since it's the comet master i'm going to put it in the comet aligned folder.
Now, the question is, why is all this green? And I wish I had a really good answer for you. I have no idea. It has something to do with my DSLR or something. There's a bias. There's a green bias. I could fix that. But if I fix it here, then I got to fix it exactly the same way on the Star Master or else things start to mess up. So I'm just going to fix it all at the end. Okay, so there's my Comet Master. I'm going to minimize that and bring it over here at the bottom. So now I want to go back to Comet Alignment. Now, you remember we had those original stars that we that we did the original pictures that we did the image registration on. And if we want, we can double click that one and you'll see there's the same same picture and the same location uh, that we identified before. And you can tell that the same. I can show you the other picture. And adjust it. And there's the other other one that has this that has the comet in a different place. These are the two coordinates, the same data that we had we initially when we started with. But now what I want to do, and I can close these just to be neat. What I want to do now is I want to subtract this image, my comet master image. I want to take that image and I want to subtract it from every single one of this of the star registered images. So I want to make sure that the Comet Master is chosen. I want to have uh, image integration. That's what we're using. And we want to make sure that Comet, um, Comet Aligned is checked. And they they say you can play around with choosing Normalize, but I, I, I tried it once. I didn't like the results, so I don't do that. So now we're going to subtract the Comet from every one of those registered images that we had. Those are the very ones we started with. Well, not the ones we started. The ones we started with were not registered on anything. So we we thing used to do it was basically just erasing everything. <laughs> uh oh, uh oh, no, well, it'll be all right. While we're waiting, are there any questions? Bob, none have come to me, but if any if anybody has a question, please just feel free to unmute yourself and ask. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up Blink. Uh, right. What I forgot to do, no, I didn't. All right. What what we're gonna what I did here, I'm going to open those up. I forgot to change the location where these files were stored, so I have it I have it stored in the wrong place, but. Nonetheless, we're not going to use the old files anymore anyway. So what we have now is all the, we have, we're going to look at every single one of those star fields and the comet should have been erased. But look, it hasn't been erased. Oh, darn. Comet hasn't been, it's dimmer, but it's not been erased. So if that's a problem, if, if you process this through and you find that that's a problem, that you need to erase it more, you go back to the, the common alignment process again, and you fool around with, I'm sorry, the Im image integration process. No, the common alignment process, parameters, subtract. Um, it turns out this doesn't, isn't a big problem, and you'll see as I, as I finish the demonstration. It's reduced in size. All of this stuff is gone. The only thing that's left is the head of the comet. Um, depending on the image that you process, that may be a problem, and you'll have to go back to the creation of the Comet Master in image integration and change those parameters. You might want to use, instead of using Windsorized, you might want to use ESD or one of the other selections that you have. So I'm going to stop this and move on. And we're going to claim those to be fine. So now we're going to go back to image integration. 
image integration. We're going to clear these and add the files we just created. Normally, if I didn't make a mistake, I would have put those in a folder called star aligned. But I forgot to do that, so they're now in comet aligned. So we're going to open up the ones we just created. Hope that's not too confusing for people. Uh, we're going to still use Windsor Eyes Sigma clipping because that works, has worked for me. We're going to check this and we're going to move this back up to high or up to, up to three, which is where it was. And again, play around with these numbers. If you know, it doesn't take very long to process a set, see how it works and come back and process the set say, and try it again. Um, it's, it's the way you get better, better results. And now we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to take those six images that are star lined but have had most of the comet erased, and we're going to smash them together and create a single image, which we will call our star master. So, Bob, while this is running, we do have another question here. Um, so you said your original, your full set of images was 26, 27, 28 images for right. this thing, and you selected six to do for this. Yes, that's correct. Said a couple times now, you've got to play with parameters here and there to find what works for the images you have. Right. Um, is it reasonable to, you know, say you've got 30 or, you know, some of these other folks who have, you know, 100 images, whatever, um, can you reasonably grab, you know, three from the beginning part of your sequence, three from the ending part of your sequence, Find a set of parameters that work for those and have faith that when you apply that to your whole set, you're going to get a good result or uh, or do you have to, you know, do you have to make do you, do you have to make scrambled eggs every time you make a change in the parameters? I, I will say have faith is a strong word. <laughs> um, all I can suggest, if every image, every every target is different. Um, I would suggest trying that because it's a lot quicker to, to sample six or nine images and see how they come out and then see how that works on the full set uh, once you get some parameters you like. I don't know the answer to the question. It's a subtle way of trying to tell you that. Um, all I can suggest job. is if that's, if that's a situation you're in, you raise a very good question. Try it out. Try a you know try a subset of images and see if the see if the settings work for you, and if it does, go back and try it on the larger set and see if that that makes spaghetti sauce for you. Um, if it doesn't, well, then you're probably going to have to be stuck with with try, playing around with the large data set. Yeah. Linda, I don't. Linda Fowler is uh, is maybe on the line. I don't know. Linda has a lot more experience with with um, large data sets than I do. So if she's around, maybe she could chime in. But um, I, again, I don't know the answer to the question, but it's a reasonably good, not reasonably good, it's a reasonable question, good question. And all I can suggest is try it out and see. One of the nice parts about um, PixInsight is you you get to go back. If you do something to an image you don't like, just hit, just go back up here and hit the back button and it undoes whatever you did. So if you don't like what it did and you want to get rid of it, just undo it and you go back to, to where you were. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Okay, so let's look at these images here. This is uh, what the, is the high Im the high pixels that were rejected. So they found some high pixels here in the where the comet was that they have rejected. Let me, let me see if this helps. Not much. They found some high pixels that were rejected. They didn't find any low pixels that were rejected except over here in the in the edge, which we don't care about. So now, if we go back to the main picture, you can see some stars here. Let's let's expand that. And I still have a little bit of glow here. If that bothers you, and if you don't like the result that result that comes out of it once you do that, then you go back and you know ch you change those parameters and you try it until you get rid of it. However, I found that it this is where the comet's going to be anyway. When I paste the big fat comet on top of this, it's going to overwrite that big time. So in this particular image, it's not going to make that much of a difference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to file, save as, 
And because I want to put it in the right place, I'm going to put it in the star aligned star master. And we'll save that. Okay. So we now have we have the star master and we have the comet master. So that's all we really need. The next thing we want to do is open something called pixel math. And this is, to a large degree, I, I'm probably going to be wrong from a mathematical standpoint here, but this is basically matrix math at its simplest level. I want to take that, for every pixel in this picture, I want to take that pixel and do this and do something with this pixel. I want to add them together. I want to divide by them or whatever. Pixel math is uh, tremendously powerful because you get to use ma mathematical expressions. So I want to take integration one. Or integration. I don't remember which one that is. I didn't. I didn't rename it. But I want to add that to integration. To the other integration, which is which is um, one's one's uh, integration. One is the star field, and integration integration period is the comet ma comet master. So I'm adding the comet master to the uh, star master, and it's basically that simple. Okay. So I say okay. I say execute. Can't do that. There's no active image window. So let's activate these and execute. So basically, it's taking those two images and adding them together. And I want to take this off, put it back on. So now we get the, the comet, we get the tail, but it's green and we don't like green. So we open something called Screen transfer function. And this is a little bit of the black magic that, that PixInsight has that I really don't want to have to try and explain. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I don't. So um, basically what I did is I took the link off and I stretched it without all the colors being linked. And when I did that, I come up with an image that looks halfway decent. Okay, and if you if we have time, I will just process all process histogram transformation. Hopefully this will work. And I basically drag this down to here. This is why PixInsight is somewhat magic. Oh, I got a view, select a view. Integration, integration. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to drag this down to here. Try another approach here. All right, um, this, this is where I'm failing at PixInsight. I, there are some of the nuances of how to create a great picture that I'm not real familiar with. And sometimes it works for me and sometimes it doesn't. And I don't know why it doesn't when it doesn't. So that's why I have problems with PixInsight. However, here we are. We have a nice image. I'm gonna close that. Great. We have a nice image. And then with a little more processing, I can make the background darker, I can make the, the comet, the tail of the comet brighter. Um, this is basically what we do when we process any deep sky image. We stretch it, we bring it out so that you have more detail. But I now have a comet that's fairly small, fairly, fairly in place, not fairly, it is in place. And I have a star field and that's what we, we were hoping for, what we were striving for when we made this picture, when we, when we tried to create this image. Wow. That's great, Bob. It's, it's, I mean, I don't want to call it magic because magic, the definition of magic is a technology that's sufficiently advanced that we can't understand how it works. <laughs> so to that sense, it's magic, but you know, it, it really is a fairly powerful, powerful thing. Um, this is the original Comet Lovejoy when I processed it back in 2015. You can see I had tail, I had, I had uh, streaking, streaking stars. When I added the six exposures and I processed the rest of it, this is about what I could pull out with just the six sub exposures that I demonstrated for you earlier. However, when I added up all 20 through 28 sub exposures, wow. this is the image that I got. Wow. Now, if you're, if you're picky, if you're particular, you can see that there are some striations. What this is, is the, 
the, the, the stars, when I created the Comet Master, the, I didn't get rid of all of the streaking stars. But it's not that bad. I don't find it, if I took more time and was more careful, I could probably get rid of that, but I chose not to do that. So um, the rest, if we have time, I can show you some more pictures. Please. Right now, I, I want to come back and see if there are any questions before I uh, brag a little bit about myself. No, I'm sorry, before I uh, end the conversation. <laughs> If anyone has any questions, please. None have come through on chat. Hey, we still have 28 people online too. That's cool. Bob, a quick question here. Yes. Do you ever go from pics inside over just regular photo editing software at any point? Ab absolutely. When I get when I get to this stage, because I'm not a pics inside expert, let me let me back up a little bit. You can do things with Pixite. You know anything anything you can do with Photoshop, you can do with Pics Insight. It's it's made for this. PixInsight is made for bringing out detail. But I am far more familiar with Photoshop, so I'll save this as a TIFF file. Right now, it's the extend, extended thing format that PixInsight uses. I'll save it, file, save as, and I'll save it as a TIFF file. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll use Pixin, I'll use Photoshop to basically darken and stretch and noise reduction and all this other stuff. So yes, that's what I do. Great. So Bob, I think, yeah, let's see a couple more of your, of your comments. Okay. Uh, Hartley 2. This is uh, 40 minutes, 40 minutes of exposures. Again, focused, uh, the, all the images are centered on the stars. Um, this is an interesting presentation. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Here I have all the stars aligned on the comet. I'm sorry, all the, all the sub-exposures aligned on the comet. So the comet is a single image, but the stars are blurred. It's because I used an average combine. Basically, it takes the average of all the images, and even there's a star, since there's a star in one of them, the average is going to be less than zero. But if I use a median combine, which does it differently, it doesn't take into account all the stars. The fact that stars are in, it, it takes into account the fact that the stars are not in every image. It then reduces this the um, the star field behind it. But if I fix on the stars, I don't think I can zoom in. If I fix on the stars, this is the picture I showed before. We have the the head of the comet smearing. Oops, head of the comet smearing. But if I and that's on an average combine. If I use a median combine, the head of the comet actually disappears, and all I have is the uh, the, the coma of the comet. So I thought that was an interesting thing that we worked on. Way back when, this may have been my first astronomy image. This is Hale Bopp. Um, this is a scan of a print that I took uh, way back when Hale Bopp was on. You can see the Pleiades here. I built myself a barn door mount, went down to a parking, I mean, to a golf course in Fredericksburg. Why I went to Fredericksburg, I don't know, but we were parking a, a, a golf course in Fredericksburg. My daughter was under a blanket with a flashlight calling out time. And I'm turning the screw on the barn door mount so that the camera can track the sky. And I, I was quite happy with this. I thought it came out pretty well. This is Comet Catalina. I'm sorry, I don't remember the date. But I'm anxious to try this new process on this comet because it's got a, a tail and an anti-tail. Uh, it's got the, um, the, the, the um, it's got an, eye, an ion tail and a dust tail. And um, um, that, that will make a really, I think it will make a really, really nice image. These are just standard images processed the conventional way. I haven't tried any of them with that. Comet Ison, this was going to be a spectacular one. And it was, it was approaching the sun over Thanksgiving. And on Thanksgiving Day, it got too close to the sun and broke up. We thought we were going to have a wonderful, spectacular image as Ison got higher in the sky during, during after the close approach, but it just broke up. And we never saw it again. Uh, Comet Pan Stars. This is a different. Pan Stars is a, a search uh, routine. They they search the sky for comets, and so you'll see a number of comets that are named Pan Stars. Also true for Swan. Um, again, this is a another image. This is Wurtnin. That's the one you saw before, as an example. In fact, I used Wurtnin as the processing example when I gave this at the uh, at the uh, Byron Berger. Um, thing. Um, 
I'll offer you guys this following handout if you want. It's basically four four pages, um, and I'll send it to you. I'll send it to the club, and they can distribute it, or you can email me if you have my email. That's T R A U B E R at AOL.com. My last name with an R. Don't forget the E. Um, and it's basically the whole presentation in four pages. The part one of the comment of the of the process is doing the comment alignment process. And then you do the image integration process and you save that as the comment master. Part two of the uh, star master process is you do the comment the, uh, the subtraction using the comment alignment process. And then part number two is this, is you use the uh, image integration to isolate the comment and subtract the comment. And then basically you save that as an image and then you combine it together. So that's all I got. Bob, that's great. Thank you. My gosh, yeah, that's that, that, that's all you got. That's still that's. <laughs> I'm encouraged that there are still 26 people hanging in for this. Oh thing. no, no, that's that's that. It's really neat to see, and it'll be fun to see what you know if you do go back and reprocess some of those older images to see. I'll post, I'll post you, he's out of that detail. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun to see. Yeah. Wow. Comments. Yeah. Comments are amazing. Um, oh, thank you, Tommy. Appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. So, Bob, if you don't mind, let's see. I'm going to take back the. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, that's cool. No, it's not. How do I stop? Let's see if I. Stop presenting. There we go. I've <laughs> <laughs> uh, never seen that before. That, that was pretty. That's pretty incredible. So, anyway, folks, uh, after these last, you know. Last month and this month, uh, the timing of our meeting was thrown off by Easter and then, of course, by Mother's Day, uh, as, as it almost always is. Um, but starting next month, we go. Drop down. Uh, we're going to have Jennifer Weisman um, <clears throat> uh, join us to present on 30 years of cosmic discovery from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, that is, I think, I guess uh, this month is is Hubble's birthday. It, it turns 30. Uh, that's incredible uh, that we've been able to get 30 years worth of worth of amazing images out of that. Anyway, so if you are available, uh, join us online again next month on the 14th for Jennifer's presentation. And as I did this month, I will send out the link ahead of time uh, as an announcement. So it goes to everybody in the club. You'll all be able to uh, have the link and join, and we'll look forward to uh, connecting with folks then.